use your senses fully. Be where you are. Look around. Just look. Don't interpret. See the light, shapes, colors, textures. Be aware of the silent presence of each thing. Be aware of the space that allows everything to be. Listen to the sounds. Don't judge them. Listen to the silence underneath the sounds. Touch something, anything, and feel and acknowledge its being. Observe the rhythm of your breathing. Feel the air flowing in and out. Feel the life energy inside your body. Allow everything to be within and without. Allow the isness. Seems to take the idea that God would make an appearance more or less for granted. And so, it's very... I think the part of the reason that I've struggled so much with the Abrahamic stories is because it's so hard to get a handle on that and to understand what that might mean. And so I'm going to hit it from a bunch of different perspectives and we'll see if we can come up with some understanding of it. The first thing I'll do is tell you a story about a female neurologist whose name escapes me at the moment. She wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight. Jill Bolte, I think is her name. And she was a Harvard trained. She was she had she had medical training from Harvard in neuropsychological function and knew a lot about hemispheric specialization. We talked a little bit about hemispheric specialization before. One of the ways of conceptualizing the difference between the two hemispheres is that the left hemisphere operates in known territory and the right hemisphere operates in unknown territory. That's one way of thinking about it. The left hemisphere operates in the orderly domain and the right hemisphere operates in the chaotic domain or the left hemisphere operates in the domain of detail and the right hemisphere operates in the domain of the large picture it's something like that now people differ in their neurological wiring so those are overgeneralizations but that's okay We're, we'll live with that for the time being it's certainly not an overgeneralization to point out that you do in fact have two hemispheres and that their structures differ and if the connections between them are cut which could happen for example if you had surgery for intractable epilepsy that each hemisphere would be capable of housing its own consciousness that's been well documented by a neuro, neuro, neurologist named Gazaniga who did and Sperry who did split brain experiments must be 30 years ago now so, and we know that the right and the left hemisphere are specialized for different functions. The right hemisphere, for example, seems to be more involved in the generation of negative emotion and the left hemisphere more involved in the generation of positive emotion and approach. So the right hemisphere stops you and the left hemisphere moves you forward. Anyways, Jill Bolte, I hope I've got that right, had a stroke and maintained consciousness during the stroke and analyzed it while it was happening. And she was able, while it was happening, to hypothesize about what part of her brain was being destroyed. And what, so she had a congenital blood vessel malformation and had an aneurysm. And it just about killed her. But she said that it affected her left hemisphere. And she said that she experienced a sense of divine unity as a consequence of the stroke because the left hemisphere function was disrupted and destroyed and so she became right hemisphere dominant and her experience of that was the dissolution of the specific ego into the into absolute consciousness something like that now that's only a case study and you don't want to make too much of case studies but there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that those two kinds of consciousness exist one being your consciousness of you as a localized and specified being and the other being this capacity to experience oceanic dissolution and the sense of the cosmos being one now why we have those capacities for different conscious experiences is very difficult to understand I mean Part of me thinks that maybe we have a generic human brain that's the brain of the species. And allied with that, we have a specific individual brain 
and one is the left hemisphere and the other is the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere being the specific individual brain. And usually it's on and working because you obviously have to take care of yourself as a specific entity and not as a generalized cosmic phenomena. It's hard to dice salary when you're a generalized cosmic phenomena, right? So you have to be more pointed than that. But, but look, let, let's make no mistake about it. The fact that those different states of consciousness exist is not disputable. They can be elicited in all sorts of ways. And so, I'm going to read you something that Aldous Huxley wrote about this back, I think, in 1956. This was after he started his experimentation with mescaline. Because the psychedelics were introduced into Western culture in the 1950s in a whole bunch of different ways. Psilocybin mushrooms, LSD, that was discovered right after the end of World War II. It was discovered by accident, actually. The laboratory, Sandoz Labs, the guy who discovered it, Albert Hoffman, had spilled some on his hands. You could absorb it through your skin. And he was biking home and had the world's first LSD trip, which was somewhat of a shock to him, and then to the entire world. Huxley, who was a great literary figure, a real genius, um, experimented with mescaline in the late 50s. And uh, he wrote a book called The Doors of Perception, which had a huge impact on the emerging psychedelic culture, both on the East Coast at, at Harvard and on the West Coast with Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters, the people who popularized LSD. That's all documented in a book called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which I would highly recommend. It's Tom Wolfe. It's a brilliant book. Um, on the East Coast, it was Timothy Leary. I had Timothy Leary's old job at Harvard, so that was kind of cool in a warped way. So I met people there who knew him, um, who didn't think much of him also, but who did know him. But Huxley had this mescaline experience, and it transported him to this alternative consciousness. And he said that during his mescaline experience that the entire world glowed from within, like if there was an inner light like a paradisal inner light, and that everything was deeply meaningful and symbolically suggestive and overwhelming and beautiful and timeless. So he had an experience of divine eternity, I suppose, is the most straightforward way to, to put that. And we know perfectly well that the psychedelic drugs that all share the same chemical structure, they interact with a brain chemical called serotonin, which is a very, very fundamental neurotransmitter. They all have approximately the same range of effects, although those effects are very, there's a very large multitude of effects that, that sort of exist underneath that umbrella. Um, Huxley was staggered by his mescaline experience. He, he, he didn't really know what to make of it. And I think that that's the common experience of people who have exceptionally profound psychedelic experiences. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some documentation about that in a moment. But he spent quite a long time trying to come to grips with what this might mean from an intellectual perspective. And, and Huxley had a great brain. I mean, if someone was going to wrestle with a problem like that, he was a good candidate. He must have had a verbal IQ of 180. I mean, his, his books are incredibly literate, incredible, incredible mastery of language and, and complexity of characterization and, and intellectual discourse. Really remarkable. So this is what Huxley had to say after his mescaline experience. He talked about heaven and hell, and he talked about that in reference to bad trips, essentially, because it was known by that point that a psychedelic experience could transport you to an ecstatic domain of divine revelation, but could take you to the worst imaginable place as well. And Huxley was very interested in why you would even have the capacity for experiences like that. And which I think is a very good question, and it's a completely unanswered question. I mean, we don't know much about consciousness, and we know even less about psychedelics, I would say. They are an absolute mystery. I don't think we understand them in the least. Huxley did a good job of starting to at least map out the mysteries of the terrain. He said, like the Earth of a hundred years ago, our mind still has its darkest Africas, its unmapped Borneos and Amazonian basins. <clears throat> in relation to the fauna, of these regions, we are not yet zoologists. We are mere naturalists and collectors of specimens. The fact is unfortunate, but we have to accept it. We have to make the best of it. However lowly, the work of the collector must be done before we can proceed to the higher scientific tasks of classification, analysis, experiment, and theory making. 
Like the giraffe and the duck-billed platypus, the creatures inhabiting these remoter regions of the mind are exceedingly improbable. Nevertheless, they exist. They are facts of observation. And as such, they cannot be ignored by anyone who is honestly trying to understand the world in which he lives. When psychiatrists started to study LSD, that was mostly in the late 50s and, and running forward from that, they thought about the drug as a psychotomimetic, which was a chemical substance that would induce psychosis. But that turned out to not be true, not with the psychedelics, because schizophrenics were given LSD, and the schizophrenics reported that, well, the experience was certainly extraordinarily strange, it wasn't like being schizophrenic. And then it was found later that if you gave schizophrenics amphetamines, that made them worse. In fact, you can induce a paranoid psychosis in a normal person by overdosing them with amphetamines. So whatever the hallucinogens or the psychedelics are doing, it's not the same thing as mania, and it's not the same thing as schizophrenia. Not at all. So, So you can't just write the experience off as an induced psychosis. Whatever it is, independent of its utility or lack thereof, it's not that. Now it can be induced by drugs. It can be induced by deprivation, right? I mean, there are accounts throughout history of people putting themselves in extreme physiological situations in order to induce transformations of consciousness. Fasting is one of the routes to doing that. Dancing is another route. Isolation, prolonged periods of isolation will also do it. Now, you, you could say that exposing yourself to any of those in excess produces a state that's indistinguishable from illness and that there's no reason to assume that the phenomena that are associated with illness have any utility whatsoever. Although, it's interesting to me that a disrupted consciousness can produce coherent experiences. It's not exactly what you expect if it was just an illness. You know, if you develop, say, a high fever, your experience isn't transcendent and coherent. It's fragmented and pathologized. And, and the dis difference, I think, is quite distinct. Although we don't, only, we don't have to only speculate about that because there's been enough experimental work done now with with hallucinogens and psychedelics to indicate that the notion that what they produce is something that's only akin to pathology is wrong. It's not a matter of opinion at this point in the sequence of scientific and historical investigation. In fact, there was a large-scale study done 10 years ago, five years ago, of 200,000 people who had experimented with psychedelics, and they were mentally and physically healthier than people who hadn't on virtually every parameter they examined. In fact, the rate of flashbacks, you've heard of LSD flashbacks, mostly a hypothetical phenomena, but the rate of self-reported flashbacks was higher among the non-psychedelic users than among the psychedelic users. So that was very interesting, it was a huge study. Now it might be, you could say that those who had experimented with psychedelics were prone to be healthier to begin with, but that still contradicts the pathology argument, so it doesn't matter either way. The pathology argument is contradicted. Now, oh, I did put that in. It was Dr. Jill, Jill Bolt Taylor. This is what she said about her stroke. I remember that first day of the stroke with terrific bittersweetness in the absence of the normal functioning of my left orientation association area. My perception of my physical boundaries was no longer limited to where my skin met air. I felt like a genie liberated from its bottle. It's a good metaphor. The energy of my spirit seemed to flow like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. The absence of physical boundary was one of glorious bliss. Recently, this Dr. Roland Griffith, I met him once at a conference in San Francisco. Surprise, surprise a conference on awe, and this was just when he was embarking on his experiments with psilocybin, which were the first experiments on hallucinogens that were permitted by the 
National Institute of Mental Health in some three, four decades. He, he had to be very careful to lay out the scientific protocols so that the ethics committees would approve the experiments and so that the federal funding agencies would allow, also allow the experiments to go through. He started to experiment with, with psilocybin and he, he's found a number of and published a number of very interesting uh, results. One was that a single psilocybin trip and I, I specify trip because Sometimes when people take psilocybin at the doses that Griffith uses, they don't have a psychedelic experience. Most people who take the dose do, but not everyone. Those who take the dose and don't have the mystical experience don't experience the consequences of taking the drug. And the consequences can be quite profound. So.